Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things anti-nuclear. My name is Libby Halevi. I'm the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when the nuclear so-called experts get it wrong. This week, we have a special report on last week's trial of the four grandmothers who on Mother's Day trespassed on the grounds of the Pilgrim Nuclear Power Station in Plymouth, Massachusetts, at the foot of Cape Cod, in a protest against the facility. Last week was their trial, and no surprise here, they were all found guilty. Here from Cape Cod Downwinders co-founder Diane Turco, the attorney Bruce Taub, and Mary Conathan, who at 71 participated in her first ever protest demonstration and got arrested. Anti-nuclear activism at its finest coming up in just a few moments. Plus, we will have numbnuts of the week, the John Stewart Twitter campaign, and more nuclear information than you're supposed to talk about at Thanksgiving. All coming up in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday, October 28, 2014, and here is the week's anti-nuclear news. A plant emergency, and we're not talking about those things that grow, but a nuclear plant emergency happened at a U.S. nuclear facility on Sunday, October 26. The Honeywell plant in Metropolis, Illinois, leaked uranium hexafluoride, or UF6, or HEX, into the community. The leak began at about 7.30 p.m. Central Time last Sunday at Honeywell's uranium conversion plant across the Ohio River from Paducah, Kentucky. Residents nearby said the cloud from the facility floated through nearby neighborhoods for approximately 20 minutes before mitigating sprayers went on. Honeywell sirens went off. And when the facility was called, guards said to shelter in place, turn off air, and close windows. As is typical in such situations, first word from Honeywell spokesmodel Peter Dalpy was a release sent to the WPSD local TV station newsroom that read, There has been no indication that any material has left the building, and neither had Elvis. Later, Dalpy said, there is not an active release at the plant anymore. Oh, that's different. Dalpy went on to say that the white, cloudy substance many people reported seeing at the plant was in actuality just spray from the water towers used to contain leaks and assured the local county sheriff's office that it was an in-house release. That must make the workers feel ever so much better. However... If there was no release, why were there so many reports by locals that they could smell something in the air when we went into town? That's a direct quote. Or, we didn't really smell anything, but have a chemical taste in our mouth. Maybe a little headache, too. One woman reported that it smelled just like polish remover. According to the ever-reliable Nuclear Rubber Stamp Commission, quote, At this point, there are no reports of UF-6 escaping the building and no sampling locations on the site outside the building detected any material. But does that speak to the fact that reports were not issued? And could it be that the sighting of the monitors was not in alignment with perhaps the direction of the perhaps plume? Room for lots of skepticism here. We'll keep you posted. There's been some confusion about the NRC's published Volume 3 of its evaluation on the proposed Yucca Mountain Nuclear Waste Storage Site. The project was shelved in 2009 by President Obama, who ordered work on Yucca Mountain to stop. The project has cost taxpayers nearly $16 billion so far and has not been either approved or declared safe. It has not been revived or resuscitated. What did happen was that, on October 16, the NRC published Volume 3 of its report. It examined whether the Energy Department's Office of Civilian Radioactive Waste Management did a fair job evaluating the characteristics of the site, such as, did the authors of the license application adequately consider the question, what can happen to the waste 
taking into account geology, earthquakes, and potential corrosion of metal barriers that might allow for radiation to escape. Did they consider the consequences if, 200,000 years from now, unsuspecting humanoids or their descendants enter the facility and open a waste package? Yucca Mountain lies in a region that has experienced sporadic volcanic activity in the last few million years. While the NRC says that all these aspects were adequately considered, it's cold comfort because nuclear waste does not belong in Yucca Mountain. It is made of porous volcanic rock that would need significant, their word, the nuclear industry's favorite word, significant reinforcement of engineered barriers to contain waste. And current NRC Chair Allison McFarlane, in 2009, while she was still in the academic world to which she will soon return, said, spent nuclear fuel is not stable in the presence of water and oxygen, to which Nuclear Hot Seat adds, Let's not forget that Yucca Mountain sits atop an aquifer. Oi. But as the report itself asks, what could go wrong? Two big reports showed up this past week on bacteria with absolutely opposite profiles when it comes to radiation. The Swiss Federal Institute of Technology reports that scientists are finding out that human activities, such as the excavation of tunnels, can lead to a blooming of underground bacterial activity. In an ongoing research project, scientists from this institute are cataloging subterranean microbial life and studying its potential to affect the performance of the protective barriers used to contain nuclear waste, including canisters, concrete, and adjacent rocks. Meanwhile, Bloomberg reports on Deococcus radiodurans, which is considered by the Guinness Book of World Records as the world's toughest bacterium. It's a microbe that can survive drought, lack of nutrients, and, most importantly, a thousand times more radiation than a person can. In fact, the bacterium is the most radiation-resistant organism known. Both these articles will be linked on our website, NuclearHotSeat.com, under this week's episode, number 175. We will also link to an article by Al Jazeera America that thousands of sick nuclear workers are awaiting compensation at Hanford. They've applied for medical benefits after working at the contaminated weapons plant site in Washington State, but apparently they haven't gotten them yet. Over to the other side of the Pacific now, where the Japan Times has reported that a sleeping volcano next to the already damaged Sendai nuclear power facility is beginning to shake. Mount Aoyama sits virtually next door to the power plant, and in recent weeks it has started experiencing tremors, this according to the Japanese Meteorological Agency's Volcano Bureau. The implications against starting Sendai's nuclear power plant are inescapable. Mount Aoyama has suddenly gone from the dormant end of the threat scale to the second highest level. That means the area around the crater can be regarded as dangerous and that small-scale eruptions are likely. The Wall Street Journal, citing a study by experts at Kobe University, warned... One major volcanic eruption could make Japan extinct. The Japan Times quoted further from the same study, saying, A disaster on Kyushu would see an area with 7 million people buried by flows of lava and molten rock in just two hours, making nearly the entire country unlivable. It would be hopeless trying to save approximately 120 million people. Mount Aoyama is only 65 kilometers, or 40 miles, away from the Sendai nuclear power plant, which is the one that Japan wants to restart first. Huzzah! If you need any other reasons to be afraid of nuclear, try this one on for size. Radiation levels have surged yet again at the Fukushima plant. Tokyo Electric Power Company admits that it has found high levels of radioactive cesium in groundwater in the compound. 
in samples taken on Wednesday, October 22nd, from wells next to the destroyed nuclear reactors. Readings showed that the water had 460,000 becquerels of cesium per liter. Officials say that those levels are 800 to 900 times the previous peak. Not what's normal, the previous peak. And there's no sign that this is going to turn around. Nuclear Hot Seat will be interviewing Arnie Gunderson of Fairwinds Energy Education within two weeks. And we'll get his input as to where this excessive radiation is coming from. My bet, it's from groundwater in touch with the molten cores. In India, major turbine problems have shown up at the brand new Kudankulam nuclear power plant. In a gross understatement, the Times of India reports that one of their sources said, the turbine of the first unit has developed mm, some problems. It seems some component inside the turbine turned loose and damaged the turbine blades. How San Onofre of them. The unit was initially shut down for maintenance in July of this year and restarted in September, then stopped operations on September 26 due to the turbine problems. G. Sundarajan, an anti-nuclear power activist who has filed a case against Kudankulam in the Supreme Court of India questioning its safety, said, even before starting its commercial operations, this world-class third-generation plant is on the blink. In Ukraine, Russia's nuclear version of a Matryoshka doll has the second half of the new safe confinement for Chernobyl now in place. Because of political unrest in Ukraine, work did stop for a while, but was resumed because, let's face it, radiation pays absolutely no attention to politics, and they knew this needed to get done. The building, which is estimated to cost approximately two and three quarter billion dollars in U.S. money, is set to be finished at the end of 2017 and has been designed to last a whopping 100 years against 24,000 years of half-life for plutonium. So what that means is that somewhere around 2117, they're going to have to do this all over again and add the next level to the nuclear nesting dolls of Chernobyl. And now... Nuclear hot seat, nuclear hot seat. Well, there's good news and bad news on the international front. The good news? The U.S. and Russia finally found a way to cooperate. The bad news? They're doing it by joining forces to block a European plan to raise the protection of nuclear reactors against natural disasters. Envoys from both countries are trying to derail a Swiss-led initiative that would force nuclear operators to invest more on safety. Nuclear safety. What a concept. But these envoys are undermining attempts to harmonize global safety regulation. This according to eight European and U.S. diplomats who attended meetings in Vienna last week at the Convention on Nuclear Safety. This story comes from Bloomberg News. You see, European attempts to impose higher safety standards would make nuclear power more costly, just as reactor operators come under price pressure from cheaper natural gas. And, oh, yes, don't forget about renewables. They're coming from behind, and they're taking the lead, and they're about to forge into the lead. Just ask Germany. As regards nuclear safety an oxymoron if I've ever heard one, European utilities pay as much as five times more than the United States to fit out plants to withstand earthquakes and floods. And believe it or not, no international authority exists to compel countries to adopt safety standards. Instead, regulators from around the world routinely review each other's practices to figure out which works best. And of course... In the case of the United States nuclear operators, what works best is always the cheapest. 
They're just looking for a way to kick the can down the road and pass it on to the next generation and all generations after that. So to you envoys from the United States and Russia who are working against nuclear safety on behalf of your not-so-benevolent overlords, you have earned, truly earned, this week's Nuclear Hot Seed, not nuts on a week. In keeping with the spirit of Halloween, seeing as we deal with the scariest information on the face of the planet, last year I asked activists at an event what they found most frightening about nuclear. I'm Eve Andre Laramie. I'm the chairperson of the Art and Art History Department at Pace University in New York City. I've been an anti-nuclear activist since 1980, and I care about the future. I care about future generations to come, and the fact that nuclear energy has been around for over 60 years, we don't have a plan for its waste that I have any confidence in, nor the country has any confidence in, I will find Fight this battle till the end. And what scares you most about nuclear? The damage to the genome. Hi, Libby. Patty Davis. Been working with San Onofre Safety, San Clemente Green, Rose, you know, all the groups here. The thing that scares me the most? Evacuation. I can't even imagine the day that the sirens actually go off for real what people would actually do. It's never been tried in the real world, and I just think that would be the disaster upon the disaster. I think it would be the most tragic catastrophe ever imagined. I can't imagine anybody getting out of here safely. I'm Martha Sullivan. I'm with the Coalition to Decommission San Onofre, and I think what scares me most about uh, nuclear is it's forever. My name is Nikki Bay. The most things I'm afraid about uh, nuclear power is uh, people lost their homeland. So many people, like 140,000 people are still unable to go back to their hometown in Japan. So I'm really, really um, afraid. Well, my name is Paul Gunter, and I'm with uh, Beyond Nuclear out of Tacoma Park, Maryland. And what scares me most about nuclear power is we're going to have to reincarnate back into activism to deal with things like nuclear waste, where you know we, we now know that uh, long after these nuclear power plants are closed and the last watt of electricity has been generated, there will be a toxic legacy and liability that will be passed on without any benefit, only liability. And it's that liability for generations to come that scares me the most. This is Gary Hedrick, co-founder of San Clemente Green. And the scariest thing about the nuclear problem to me is the uncertainty. That's the scariest part. No one has any good answers for some serious problems. And uh, that's got me shaking in my boots. No tricks or treats here. I'm Myla Reason, and I'm living in the San Onofre danger zone. Even though the plant is closed, we've got all this nuclear waste. But what's scaring me right now most is the reactor cores in the Fukushima 4 pools because um, that's so unstable. The pools are the spent fuel pools are elevated, and we could have a, a mega catastrophe if those reactors, rea- reactor cores blow. Alice Slater, I'm with the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation, and what scares me most about nuclear is that we're currently selling nuclear power plants to Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Algeria, and every nuclear power plant is a bomb factory. That's why what we're seeing with Iran, we're so worried because even though they have the legal right to enrich uranium, you just turn the screw one more time and you make bomb material. So I think it's totally scary that our government is spreading this evil technology around the planet and it's only going to come back to bite us. 
My name is Michelle Lee. I'm with the Nuclear Information and Resource Service, which is a watchdog of the nuclear power, commercial nuclear industry. And I'm also with uh, a group called FaZe, Public Health and Sustainable Energy. What scares me most about Indian Point, honestly, is that it's an old machine. And I don't care whether you're talking about a dishwasher or a NASA satellite. Once you get to the point where the machine is aged out, it goes. That's a basic engineering 101. You have most of the problems in machinery is either very early in, in its life when there are kinks or flaws exposed or when it ages and things start to break down. And there's simply no way to fix all the components of the plant or to even monitor them because you have hundreds of miles of buried components, literally. My name is Darren R. McClure. I am uh, the person that runs Sananofray.com. The thing that scares me the most about nuclear is no one knows how long forever is. We have to keep putting this stuff into dry casts forever. 40 years of power will never pay for a million years of nuclear waste. So, happy Halloween. And if that doesn't scare you, nothing will. We will have our special feature in just a moment, but first, read any good ebooks lately? Yes, I glow in the dark. One mile from Three Mile Island to Fukushima and beyond is my ebook, and it tells the story of what it's like to be one mile away from a nuclear reactor when it's being very naughty. The book is available on Amazon Kindle. And it's filled with all kinds of factual information, both of the personal nature and of the activist nature, and ends up with telling you what you, yes, you can do to get active in your own environment. Along the way, it is a terrific read, if I do say so myself. So go to Amazon, purchase it, and know that by doing so, you're helping to support me, the work, and this show. I'm proud to bring you a special report on the Pilgrim trial, which was held last week. To recap, on May 11th of 2014, this year, it was Mother's Day, four members of the Cape Cod Downwinders, a group that protests the Pilgrim Nuclear Power Station in Plymouth, Massachusetts, walked onto the Entergy facility and were arrested for trespassing. Last week was their trial. Nuclear Hot Seat spoke with two of the grandmothers who were participants in this and their attorney to get a first-hand perspective on the events. First, Mary Conathan explained how she became involved in activism for the first time ever at the age of 71, as well as what the demonstration itself was like. You were one of the four defendants, the four grandmothers, in the case that was recently heard in Massachusetts court dealing with the Mother's Day action that took place at the Pilgrim Nuclear Power Station. I understand that this was the first time you have ever participated in an action such as this. How did you get involved? What drew you to the cause? Probably an action of any of any kind. Um, in fact, my sister um, became involved with the Downwinders probably a year before I, and she discussed it with me a few times. I I wound up watching a 60-minute documentary on Fukushima now after the meltdown, and I was horrified. I then started reading everything I could get my hands on that was published about our our power plant. We have such a unique situation in that we are a uh, we are connected to the mainland by two bridges. Only to find out, and this probably was what pushed me into the action that I did take, was that we, we are being told to shelter in place. We cannot drive over the bridges until they evacuate the town within the 10-mile radius of the uh, nuclear reactor. When you say it is two bridges, are you on Cape Cod? I am on Cape Cod in a town called Chatham, a very picturesque little fishing village on what we would call the elbow. If you look at Cape Cod as uh, being shaped like an arm, we are on the elbow. Getting back to your involvement, you educated yourself after Fukushima. When did you join with the Downwinders? 
Well, the downwinders were one of my methods of educating myself. They put out a good deal of actual information about the plant. I would say it was in March, maybe February or March of this year, that I started attending meetings and going to the various demonstrations and have been an active member since then. How aware were you that there was a possibility that you could be arrested, and what did you do to prepare for that possible eventuality? Um, I, I spoke with Diane Turco, who, who founded the Downwinders, um, in advance and asked her what to expect, and she was very clear that uh, we, that you really did not know what to expect, that uh, we would be arrested, we would, we would spend some time in the jail. We could elect to bail ourselves out or we could refuse to and uh, run the risk of spending more time in the jail. I did, in fact, bail myself out, as the other three of the four did. What were you doing right before you walked onto the property, what were you doing on the property, and how long did it take before you were arrested? There were about 50 of us who had a rally in the park about a mile away from the, from the nuclear reactor, from, from the energy uh, grounds. We rallied in the park. We had some poetry reading. There were several speeches, and then we proceeded to walk down Powerhouse Road, which was the entryway to the plant. There were people singing, there were people talking, there were people gathered, and we went across. Um, Diane told us in which order, but those of us who were uh, stepping forward to be arrested um, walked one at a time across the line. We were greeted by the police and by a uh, plant security agent. Were they alerted to the fact that you were going to be there, or they just kind of figured it out? No. Diane calls in advance so that they are aware of us coming. They knew we were coming. The gates were open. Now, I think I was the third to go. Uh, we were handcuffed, led to the, I called it a paddy wagon, they called it a van. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's a generational difference. I guess so. We were <laughs> I'd call it a paddy wagon, too. I thought it was a paddy wagon. Um, you know, we were handcuffed with these, with these plastic ties and taken to, uh, to the Plymouth County Jail, where we were given our rights. They took our jewelry. They took, I think they took our shoes. And uh, one at a time we were, we were read our rights. We were photographed. We were given um, our um, Miranda rights. And we were led to the jail, to, to each individual jail uh, house. It was a uh, very stark, four-sided, probably eight-by-eight eight room with a uh, stainless steel toilet and uh, camera. <laughs> <laughs> And it kept me from <laughs> no <laughs> privacy yeah, in yeah. jail. <laughs> I guess. Not. Did you receive any kind of special treatment? And was there any time that you felt yourself to be in jeopardy? No, actually, I was surprised at how very cooperative, how very gentle the law enforcement. They they actually two of them uh, at different times said that they appreciated what we were going to do. Of course, they are the first responders, and they said, um, "You guys uh, are the only way we're going to get this closed." <gasps> It was it was shocking, and I had that happen again when we were arraigned, and I was in a in a room where they were writing up our the paperwork, doing the paperwork, and um, I think this might have been one of the because it was his office. I think he was one of the heads of the department, and he uh, in the Plymouth. This was in the Plymouth courthouse the day of arraignment, which was the day following our arrest, and he said, "A lot of us are on your side. You guys." keep it up. So we were very encouraged by, by just stranger um, support, and particularly first responder. <laughs> that was Kate Codd, Downwinder, and one of the four grandmothers, Mary Conathan. Bruce Taub was the attorney for three of the grandmothers, Mary Conathan, Sarah Thatcher, and Susan Carpenter. Diane Turco decided to represent herself so she could make a final statement to the court. Bruce filled us in on the legal side of things and how the trial went. Bruce, let's start out with a little bit about your background and how you became involved in the Pilgrim Grandmother's trial. For the last 25 years of my life, I've been an attorney. I am also a social activist of sorts and have been very concerned with climate issues. I live on Cape Cod, and as I became aware of the Pilgrim Nuclear Power Factory, we try not to call it a plant. We think plants are green living things, and it's hardly that. I joined a group called Cape Downwinders, which
which has been active over the past few decades in trying to close the plant. And one thing led to the other, and these brave women got arrested, and they needed legal counsel, and I offered to uh, represent them. Now, the women were charged with trespassing on Energy's Pilgrim Nuclear Power Station on Mother's Day, May 11, 2014, while they were trying to plant flowers to protest against the harm posed by nuclear reactors to the health of children. How serious were these trespassing charges? They were facing a criminal trespass complaint, which had a maximum sentence of 30 days in jail and a $100 fine. I don't know if you call that serious or not, but uh, the state had previously uh, dropped charges against them, earlier trespasses. The state had tried uh, the case against a larger group of trespasses earlier in the year, including three of the four defendants in this case. When they were found guilty in that case, they received suspended sentences. And in this instance, when they were found guilty, they were also given suspended sentences, but they were placed on probation for a year with the threat of the 30 days in jail hanging over them. The chances of probation are very modest. They merely have to avoid arrest for another year. There was no stay-away order as such, because that would have been unconstitutional, but... The uh, threat of instantly being sent to jail if they are again arrested hangs over their heads for a year. What, if any, strategy did you take for the trial? The only defense that's available, at least the only defense I'm aware of, is what's called the necessity defense. And the necessity defense, in essence, says the situation that you are trying to address, the evil or wrong that you are trying to abate, is more serious than the trespass, and therefore you could be forgiven for your trespass because you've acted out of, quote-unquote, necessity. So in this case, we trespass because we were trying to prevent the greater harm of the continued operation and the dangers presented by the nuclear power plant. Diane Turco, one of the four grandmothers arrested in this case, provided perspective on the strategy behind the entire demonstration. The grandmothers in the Cape Town Wonders employed Martin Luther King's strategy of creative tension. And creative tension, which he wrote in a letter from a Birmingham jail, is when a community is confronted with an issue and it is dramatized so that that issue can no longer be ignored. And so in Mother's Day, we stepped over the line onto the property of Entergy to plant flowers. A brilliant move. Who can object to grandmothers planting flowers? Exactly. Exactly. And we were there, and again with Sarah's statement, to say, why are we there? We are calling attention to this evil that is being perpetrated on our children every day, and it needs to stop. We'll hear more from Diane Turco at the end of the program. For now, back to attorney Bruce Taub. Talk about the witnesses who spoke on behalf of the grandmothers and any problems that you had in getting them to be allowed to speak. The necessity defense requires that you advance a certain facts that might establish these three elements, and then the burden shifts to the state to refute those each beyond a reasonable doubt. And the three elements are, one, dangerousness, two, that you've exhausted all other legal remedies, and three, that there's a relationship between the act of trespass and the hoped-for abatement. And in order to satisfy those elements, we needed expert witnesses. And relative to the danger element of the nuclear power plant, we presented Dr. Richard Clapp, who was the uh, former head of the cancer registry for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts Department of Public Health, and Dr. Helen Caldicott. And when we first tried to present Dr. Caldicott, the judge refused 
to let her testify. He declined to let her testify on a Friday. I presented the motion for reconsideration on a Monday. It was allowed, and she testified on Wednesday. We covered this briefly last week on Nuclear Hot Seat, but what were the grounds by which Dr. Caldicott was initially not allowed to testify, and then what made the judge change his mind? He was concerned that she was going to talk about what he believed were theoretical or hypothetical dangers, dangers in the future, the risk of terrorist attack, the risk of tsunami, the risk of some accident occurring, and any future risk the judge ruled was not satisfactory for satisfying the imminent danger requirement, so that was number one. And number two, he believed that she was not familiar enough with the Pilgrim Station, that though she understood nuclear plants in general, uh, she was not familiar enough with the Pilgrim Station. It was on that basis that he precluded her testimony. The grounds on which she allowed her testimony were my advancing the argument, one, that she was not going to talk about theoretical dangers. She was going to talk about the uh, radioactive emissions from the plant and the dangers that those represented now in the present. And two, that because the Pilgrim facility is a GE Mark I reactor, that it's a cookie cutter of any other reactor. That if there's a recall of a certain car because... It has a problem. You don't need to know specifically about my car. If it's the same car, it's subject to the same defects. And on those grounds, he allowed a testimony. So we've been talking about the judge. We've talked about the state. We've talked about the defendants. But we haven't mentioned Entergy. Were there attorneys present in the courtroom, and were they pushing for any kind of condition? No. So this was purely between the state and the defendants? Once Entergy had called upon the state to arrest them for trespass, yes. During the trial, I know that there was very powerful testimony provided by Dr. Caldecott, by Massachusetts Senator Dan Wolf, by Dr. Richard Clapp. What was the response, if any, in the courtroom? as and after their testimony? It was pretty compelling. This is powerful testimony. It's chilling. Dan Wolf's testimony about the range of efforts that he'd been involved with in attempting to regulate and control the operations at the facility it was chilling. He had visited. He'd been on a particular site visit that he described the antiquated systems in operation there. If you get a chance to get a copy of his testimony, it was just remarkably compelling. The courtroom was filled. There were probably 40 people in the audience. The prosecutor was a little... Uh, nastier than she needed to be, in my opinion, and drew an occasional gasp from the audience in response to her condescending and aggressive behavior. But other than that, it was pretty quiet and attentive. How long did Dr. Caldecott have the opportunity to testify, and was there any challenge to the information she was providing? She testified for... I don't know, maybe an hour on direct. There was no constraint on the length of her testimony. She had access to a uh, chalkboard, and she uh, drew diagrams, and uh, she provided scientific information in the form of little formulas. The cross-examination was 15 minutes at the most. Again, there were no limitations placed on it by the court. And other than attempting to challenge her science with a study that had been done by some folks who are clearly industry folks and uh, a challenge to the nuclear facility emissions as opposed to 
all emissions, all radiation. There was no limitation. How long did it take Judge Sullivan to come to his ruling? And what was the response when he read the verdict or when the verdict was read in the courtroom? He ruled immediately. <laughs> he didn't so much as go off the bench. He said that while he understood the power and passion of their convictions, the law was the law and they had breached the law and they were guilty. It was a respectful courtroom. I mean, there may have been a groan or a sigh, but nothing more than that. There was an unpleasant little confrontation when the prosecutor left the courtroom because some of the witnesses, uh, this is after Judge Sullivan had left the bench, asked her to apologize for her less than kind remarks to uh, somebody as uh, seen as Dr. Caldecott and the grandmothers, not teenage drug dealers. She, of course, refused, but other than that, it was a pretty quiet scene. What was it that the prosecutor actually said that got people asking her for an apology? <laughs> <laughs> My favorite was she asked Diane Turco whether Diane Turco uh, believed that there were also natural radiation emissions in the world. And Diane said, yes, of course she did. And she said, are you trying to close the world? <laughs> <laughs> Which, I objected and the judge sustained my objection, of course. <laughs> is there a transcript available to the trial and can that be made available to general public or is it restricted in some way? No, no, no. Automatically, uh, there's a CD produced. Uh, it's recorded and Anybody can buy the CDs of the trial. I don't know what it costs, but it's not terribly expensive, maybe $50 or something like that. That would certainly be worth getting if only to have the power of the testimony combined with the stupidity or the lack of insight, shall we say, by the prosecutor. It would also make a great ebook. <laughs> well, uh, it's available. You just need to contact the clerk of the criminal courts, give them the docket number, and tell them you want it, and they'll make it available. And if Thank you have a difficulty with it, let me know, and I'll get you a copy. Oh, that's terrific. Has there been any media coverage, and if so, what has been the nature of it? The local NPR station, Cape and Island, had some news on that I saw in advance of the trial. And at the trial, largest local newspaper, the Cape Cod Times, covered the trial. A reporter named Christine Laguerre wrote a couple of really nice stories. There was a professional photographer in court. There were a couple of local Access TV folks. Maybe somebody from uh, Boston radio station, WBUR, and a gentleman named Robbie Lutzinger or something like that, who has been recording for HBO. He filmed the entire trial. Nothing from the Boston Globe, though. No, ma'am. Not word one. And Boston is within the 50-mile EPZ. I used to live in Boston, so I'm familiar with the topography there, but I was there before the nuclear reactor of Pilgrim. Oh, you're not that old. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I was just that ignorant and it was there during that time. <laughs> so, Bruce, as we bring this to a close, what, if anything, do you feel is the legacy of this trial? Do you feel that it is leaving any kind of lasting mark on any but the direct participant? I think some of the testimony will terrify the judge. I do. I think that you cannot hear the testimony and not be uh, terrified and compelled by it. I don't know as a practical matter what the legacy is. You know, we were not allowed to present Joseph Gerson. Could you explain who Dr. Gerson is? He is a long-time director of peace 
studies and anti-nuclear something or other for the American Friends Service Committee. He's a political scientist. He has a Ph.D. in political science, but his entire life has been spent as an activist, mostly focused on the question of nuclear weapons. And he was going to testify about the pace at which social movements grow and why you can't measure an act attempting to abate the evils connected with a nuclear power station in the same time frame and in the same mode as you assess the act of taking away a gun or jumping over a fence because a dog is attacking a child. Is there anything else that you would like to add as a closing statement? <laughs> Close children? <laughs> <laughs> that would be a good one. <laughs> Keep up the good work. Never surrender. <laughs> I think the protests will last as long as nuclear waste does, and we all know that's virtually forever. Yeah, unfortunately. Bruce Taub. Attorney for three of the four grandmothers. We then checked back with Diane Turco to find out her perspective, now that the case has come to its resolution, although the issues it represents, of course, have not. Looking back on it, what is your takeaway? I think this is a call to action for every mother and grandmother and everyone who uh, loves future generations to stand up and, and say, this is not acceptable that our government cannot be in compliance with the nuclear industry that harms our future generations. And uh, this whole uh, nuclear industry needs to be stopped right now. How effective do you feel this particular demonstration and what followed actually was for the people of Cape Cod and the greater Boston, New England area? The Nuclear Regulatory Commission and our government have developed an emergency plan that allows the public to be exposed to radioactive materials that will damage and harm our children and future generations. Massachusetts Emergency Management Agency Director Kurt Schwartz came down to Cape Cod and said there will be no evacuation. You know, there's only two bridges to leave the Cape. We're south of Pilgrim Nuclear. And uh, you will be staying here and take the radiation hit, and we will come down with hazmat suits and determine where the hot spots are and relocate you. And he actually said, and just like at Fukushima, you won't be able to return for a long time. So Fukushima is a huge lesson. Fukushima blew away the myth that nuclear power is safe, but citizens are responsible. Not our government, not the industry, it's the citizens that need to stand up and say this is not acceptable, it needs to be shut down. We shouldn't be threatening the planet with this kind of industry, and the nuclear industry is actually doing that. Our voice is not heard, and we need to gather more people to step out in the street and make a strong stand to tell our government that this is not acceptable. You know, as mothers and grandmothers, our first responsibility is to make sure our children are safe. And that our government will find four grandmothers guilty of trespassing when really our effort was to call attention to the dangers of nuclear power. It's really exposing the government as supporting um, the nuclear industry and their profits over public safety. And that's not the role of our government. So the people need to step up and say, we demand that it's public safety first. That was Diane Turco. Finally, we hear once more from Mary Conathan, who gives us her perspective as a first-time activist who now is a first-time criminal for her participation in the Mother's Day demonstration against the Pilgrim Nuclear Power Station. How do you feel about the experience, and would you do it again? I would do it again in a minute because I just feel that strongly about this plant. I feel like I, I am having to face my clients, people who are buying property on Cape Cod, who are probably not aware that we're within 50 miles of a potential disaster. And any risk is too much risk. Why are we having to take this risk? And how can I sell property without disclosing? In real estate, you are obliged to disclose anything that would, they call it quiet enjoyment, anything that would uh, keep a buyer from having quiet enjoyment of their property. 
I feel that it is a danger. It is something we need to alert people by. If they're going to buy on Cape Cod, they've got to know that there could be, may well be a time, or that they are running the risk of being told to shelter in place until towns around the plant are evacuated can then drive over the bridge. But by that time, the uh, plume will have done its damage and we will lose our land, uh, maybe our health, and certainly uh, our way of life. And I would do it again, and I would encourage, I have, I mean, I, I, not I would, I have encouraged people that I know, residents, I'm doing everything I can to raise awareness. Mary Conathan. We will hear from Diane Turco one more time as she shares with us her final statement to the court. It will be today's final thought. So, okay, where else are you going to get this kind of in-depth anti-nuclear information, let alone on a weekly basis? That's what Nuclear Hot Seat provides you. So here's what you can provide Nuclear Hot Seat, and that is donations, financial support. There are monthly charges that accrue to this program, and let me tell you, it's awfully tough sometimes to make the nut. So if you possibly can, no amount is too small, no amount is too large, you can donate by going to NuclearHotSeat.com. On the home page, you scroll down, find the big red Donate button, click on it, and donate via PayPal. Know that anything you can do to help helps me Keep this program going so that you get the anti-nuclear news and features every week. Activist shout-out. Many thanks again this week to Sheila Parks in Boston for her help in researching today's feature on the four grandmothers. And I must acknowledge a bit of a glitch from last week's show. In featuring a more than three-year-old interview on food safety with John Solomon of Eden Foods, I somehow missed the current controversy the company has kicked off by asking for the Hobby Lobby exemption from offering its female employees birth control. As a longtime feminist, I am appalled that this company, that any company, would take such a stand against women's health. Still... I believe that as regards the interview, there was value in hearing their actions regarding food safety in the wake of Fukushima. So for those of you who have responded, I'm sorry for your discomfort at the choice of the interview, but I do call upon a saying familiar to those who indulge in 12-step programs. Take what you need and leave the rest. And I thank you for understanding. John Stewart! Oh, just cover nuclear already, okay? Check your tweets. They're all piling up at hashtag new CNN shows. Here's today's final thought, and it goes gladly to Diane Turco. It's the statement she made at the end of last week's trial, a statement to the judge, the courtroom, and quite frankly, the world. On Mother's Day 2014, Cape Town Winders held a rally in St. Catherine's Chapel Park and marched to the Pilgrim Nuclear Power Reactor in Plymouth. We called for the closing of Entergy Corporation's Pilgrim Nuclear Power Reactor because our children and future generations are at risk to the damage of ionizing radiation. The Mother's Day Proclamation written and read by Grandmother Sarah Thatcher that day, is as follows. This Mother's Day action is an expression of our rage against the polluting nuclear reactor and our love for our children. This is not about an accident happening in the future. This is about an ongoing accident occurring daily. We have stood by and watched our air and water become polluted. The incredibly high cancer rates have become acceptable. We are churning out more and more radioactive waste with no place to go but into our own backyards and Cape Cod Bay, or to be vented, leaked, and dribbled into our atmosphere. As mothers and grandmothers who are now paying attention, we want this poisoning to stop. We are here to put our bodies on the line with an apology 
an apology that we didn't understand earlier about this evil that is being perpetrated on our children and generations to come. Our job is to see Pilgrim shut down and cleaned up. End of quote for Sarah. As grandmothers, looking back on two generations, for Mary and me and Susan and Sarah, three, we have a joyful and solemn responsibility to make sure that our children are safe. With the tragic lessons learned from Fukushima mothers, we will protect the children. We act on a moral imperative with civic responsibility. The ongoing operation of the Pilgrim Nuclear Power Reactor in Plymouth is a crime beyond what we four grandmothers have been charged with. Damaging and killing of life from exposure to ionizing radiation and the imminent threat of a catastrophic accident that is already acknowledged to be a viable event is a far greater crime than the gentle, affirming actions of four loving grandmothers. Your Honor, with our testimony presented, we hope that you will come to the conclusion that the four grandmothers did not commit a crime of trespassing, but rather, with clarity and compassion, are calling attention to the alarming truth that Energy Corporation's operation of Pilgrim Nuclear on the shores of Cape Cod Bay is the real threat and danger to our beautiful children and our beloved community, trespassing on us every single day in a most serious and deadly capacity. In closing, Mother's Day founder Julia Ward Howe exclaimed, Arise all women who have hearts, whether your baptism be that of water or tears. Say firmly, we will not have great dis questions decided by irrelevant agencies. Unquote. Most Honorable Judge Sullivan, we four grandmothers stand in your court as a serious expression of the unwillingness of the government to protect the people and seek your confirmation that our peaceful actions are urgently meaningful for the protection of our children and future generations. Otherwise, with broken hearts, we will regretfully apologize to our children once again. Diane Turco. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, October 28, 2014. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from ENENews.com, WPSD-TV, The Paducah Sun, WSIL, HEN.org, the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, Bloomberg.com, Al Jazeera America, Wall Street Journal, Japan Times, Asahi Shimbun, News.com.au, NHK, TEPCO, Teroyaki Nakajima University of Tokyo and Science Council of Japan, Global BC, Times of India, EnergyLiveNews.com, Nuclear-News.net, those dizzying spinmeisters at World Nuclear News, and the ever-heroic Nuclear Hot Seat Facebook community. You are cordially invited to join us, friend us, and tweet to John Stewart about us. Theme music written by me, sung by Marilee Weaver. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY.TV and is also available on AirProgressive.com. Our archive is available on iTunes or at our website, NuclearHotSeat.com. You can also subscribe to our podcasts on iTunes. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues, so if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at NuclearHotSeat.com. We are copyright 2014. Libby Halevi and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed for not-for-profit groups, blogs, and websites. You have my permission to reuse this material as long as proper attribution is provided. If you can give us a link as well, that's terrific. This is Libby Halevi of Hardestry Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, reminding you that we've all had our nuclear wake-up call now. Do not go back to sleep, because we are all in the nuclear hot seat.